I know nothing about it, but I'm so intrigued. The evolutionary advantage of baldness. Thank you, Miss. <laughs> So I was asked to tell a story about ancestry and obviously a large part of my ancestry is my baldness, which we jokingly refer to in my family as the dome. Baldness is looked down upon by modern society and I should have hair transplants or I should spe spread special cream, but I've always remembered a sticker that said, God made bald people beautiful. He gave the rest of the people hair. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start our story way back in time at the originals of human settlement with a character we shall call Stead. Now Stead always knew he was different. When other children were banging rocks together, he was collecting and categorising them into shapes and colours and uses. When the other children would run and greet the hunters returning from the hunt, he would be thinking about what herbs to use to cook the meal, what he could do with the byproducts of the of the of the of the of the, of the prey. <laughs> and over time he found uses for the rocks with flint to make tools. He found that by hitting flint together, he could make fire from the ash that he could fertilise plants. From that, they planted seeds in prepared dirt, prepared with the, the ash, and then mixing the ash with the rocks and the mud, they discovered bricks, and gradually life improved in the village. And when it came to his initiation time, he was christened Baldahar, he who thinks. Instead, thought endlessly about why the sky was blue, why the birds threw it, flew in a certain direction, and practical things like the uses of the stones, the ash, and, 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 such, and such like. And he became known in the village as someone who was sort of slightly eccentric, but a useful person. Until the age of 17, when all his hair fell out, and all the villagers went, at first made a joke about it, his brain is growing so big that it's pushing his hair out. <laughs> and then gradually that led to rumours that there was, there was something wrong and maybe Stead had a disease that they could catch. And the men were walking around looking into pools of water and the streams, wondering if their hair would come out. And it got to a point where it was becoming a real issue with the village. So they, they went to see the wise sorcerer who lived up in the hills in a cave. And after many days travel, they arrived at the sorcerer's cave and rang the bell of bones and waited. Eventually, with much grumbling and shuffling of feet, the sorcerer came out and blinking in the sunlight, he looked across and he saw Stead and he went, Baldaha, you're here. So it has begun. And one of the men said, how do you know Baldaha? And he said, I have had a vision of the future. Baldaha is part of the future. Come in. So they go into the cave and they walk past the stones and the shells and the plants hanging up and they all sit around the fire. And one of the men goes, we were really worried about the fact that Baldaha's hair is falling out and it's a disease that we're all going to catch. It is not a disease, it is just that he is different. But what about the future? You do not have to worry about his future because he will leave you. He's not part of your future. He's part of the world's future. Enough talk. Let us sit around and smoke ceremonial herbs and have visions. <laughs> so they pass around the, pass around the pipe and Stead has a big toke on the pipe and looking at the other men, sucks it in and holds it in and as his eyes close, his mind opens and he has a vision. A lizard comes up to him and goes, follow me. He follows the lizard to a cliff edge and the lizard goes, jump. And he jumps and he floats down and he's floating down a river and he sees the apparition of a woman's face. 
and the apparition of other women's faces of all different appearances and all different colours. And then he wakes up and he's beside the fire and the sorcerer goes, did you see it? And he went, yes. And he goes, you, your destiny is to go from the lizard's tongue through the lizard's eye down the water to your fate. You must always remember to use your brain and to use your hands. Do you understand? And Stead goes, but what about the women? <laughs> and the sorcerer goes, don't get excited. <laughs> Only one woman is for you. The other women are your children's destiny. And so they get up, they go back to camp and life goes on relatively normally until one day he's out hunting with his friend Grog and they're going along and they're walking along, walking along and it's a cloudy day and they hear <coughs> and heavy breathing and Grog and Stead freeze and go, oh no, this is bad, this is bad. And suddenly a Tyrannosaurus Rex bursts out of the bush and starts chasing them. And they're running through the bush as fast as they can go. And suddenly Stead's ahead and suddenly he's screaming. He looks back and Grog is tangled with his hair in the bushes. <laughs> and the Tyrannosaurus Rex gets him. Now what do you do when your best mate is being eaten by a Tyrannosaurus Rex? <laughs> Run. <laughs> so Stead keeps on running and he runs and he comes to the edge of a cliff and it's 200 feet down and there's water at the bottom and he goes, oh, I know the vision says that I should jump but that is a long way down. And he turns around and here's the Tyrannosaurus Rex coming along and he goes, but that's certain death, I think I'll jump. So he jumps and he flies through the air and he flaps his arms as he's seen the birds doing to no avail. Bang, straight into the water. And as he surfaces, he looks across and there's this giant eye. And it's a plesiosaur. Think Loch Ness Monster. Looking at And the plesiosaur comes down and is about to hit, bite him when suddenly the clouds break, the sun shines down, bounces off Stead's bald head <laughs> into the plesiosaur's eye, startles him. <laughs> and Stead is carried by the current out of, out of harm's way. <laughs> and he's floating along looking back at the plesiosaur thinking, oh good, I'm right now. And then turns around and goes, well where's the water going? There's just blank horizon. Down. He goes over a waterfall and falls even further, bounces into a river and is being washed along by the rapids. A passing log comes by, he grabs the log and he floats and he batters and he goes along. And then he wakes up on a beach and he hears giggling. And he goes, what's going on? And he looks up and a woman goes, do you love that log? I love this log because it has saved my life. Well, that's all very well. You better come and get some dry clothes on. So as they're walking along, she goes, and what's your, my name's Mary. What's your name? Baldahar. Oh, bald of hair. <laughs> no, you best call me Stead. <laughs> so they go back to her village. They fall in love. They have children. And over time, the children spread throughout Britain and throughout Europe. And this takes us up a huge jump in time to the mid-1600s. In the mid-1600s, everybody's wearing wigs. Now, the Steads have taken the advice of the sorcerer and are using their brains and their hands. So they're mostly farmers and artisans, and if you look back through my history, nobody goes above middle management. Everybody's, everybody works with their, everybody works with their, their hands. It's generally connected with their art, or with, with their um, farming, basically using their, their, their brains and their brains and their hands and 
not so much intelligence, but ingenuity. Because we've got bigger brains, because we've got bald heads, forced all the hair out. <coughs> In the 1600s, you start seeing steads catching ships and going overseas. We have W. Stead, the journalist, ending up in the Congo and then going back to Belgium and arguing with the king about how the Belgian people are treating the Congolese people. You have people, um, Y. Stead, turning up in America and he and his sons buy uh, wagons and go travelling uh, travelling around, around the place. You have a Stead in Australia who is... Um, commemorated on a penny, Stead and Company gross and Grocers. And a funny story connected with him is he has a menagerie of animals and there's a, a newspaper headline of how Stead's monkey has escaped and been very mischievous and caused much hilarity as it went around causing, cause, causing problems. My branch of the family stayed in England until 200 years ago. And then for reasons that I don't know, they split into three different directions. One branch went to Scotland and Germany and then ended up settling on the central coast. Another branch went to Can Canada and then back to Burrell and Ivanhoe in southern New South Wales. And my branch of the family, we send people over to Australia every generation. I was born in Cookfold in England. My parents were itinerant dairy farmers and they went to agricultural college together and they ended up having their romance on farms on separate parts, different ends of England. Apparently the wedding ring went back and forwards in the post as they sorted out their differences. But <laughs> very different people. My Papa is a very quiet man, very a, a thinker. Uh, my mother is also a thinker, but she's also a very loud woman and a talker. And classic story of my mother is talking on the phone for an hour and a half one day, laughing, carrying on. And I said, who was that? Oh, wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> when I was five years old, the dairy industry in England was um, largely privatised and my parents being contract dairy farmers were, um, to put too kind a word, of getting screwed and they decided to take, care, take advantage of the 10 bob um, immigration scheme and come to Australia. Uh, we were first in a hostel in Newcastle um, which was pretty ordinary. It was built on a um, industrial area and I remember a friend and I going out into the industrial area and kept in, catching tab not, tadpoles in radioactive pools of water. Mm. Eventually my dad was a uh, labourer for BHP and then a labourer at a building site and eventually got a job as a dairy farmer at Orangeville which was at the back of Camden down near Campbelltown outside of Sydney and back then uh, was the bush, the bush. And my mother was determined that we become Australian. We had geraniums, we made lamingtons, <laughs> we had barbecues, <laughs> we had a parrot that we taught to sing Pop Goes the Weasel. <laughs> my mother nearly went insane with the cicadas just gee all the time and frequently used to drive down the road saying that she was going to run away but it was okay. She always came back. She, my brother came, of, my sister and I were born in England. My brother was born over in Australia and he was interesting in the fact that he was the first idea that I had of genetics in the Stead family. I knew that my great-grandfather was a Norwegian sea captain, hence I had a red beard. It's grey now, but it used to be red. And I knew that my mother, whose maiden name was Gherkin, had German ancestry. But beyond that, I hadn't really thought about it until my brother came along and my 
sister and I are both blonde and pale skinned and he was a brunette with dark skin to the point where in a middle class white Australian um, setting everybody thought he was adopted and he was actually a Celtic throwback that comes back once every generation and um, on my mother's side his cousin is also a dark 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 skinned person and it sort of introduced me to the idea of how the steads were a bit beyond just stead they were involved the genetics of other people and if we think back to Baldahar how he had visions of different women from different countries and different races you start to see what's where the story's going. Grew up in Camden, went up to Armidale, studied in Armidale, specialising in drinking at the University Bistro. <laughs> I, I would have got my I would have got my PhD in Bistrology, but I couldn't behave myself when I was drunk. <laughs> I managed to get uh, qualified as a biological technician, and then sitting around the university bar looking around, I thought these people are doing university, I can do university too, and started a Bachelor of Arts majoring in, majoring in sociology. I met a lady called Judy, and we were gonna have a baby, and so it was decided that me being in the university setting and drinking and doing drugs was not really gonna set in with a family atmosphere, so we moved out of Armdale and down to, down to Griffith. New South Wales, where I became a uh, gardener. So I gardened for um, pensioners mainly. Um, I had a rule that I would not garden for anybody under the age of 50, because that seemed to be, to me, where the value of a dollar and a hard day's work ended. People who were younger than that thought just because they were paying you, they could tell you how to garden. Well, it was pretty pointless telling me how to garden because I have generations of it behind me and I knew what I was doing for, the, doing for a job. One day, my grandfather had passed away, Mark Gherkin, and my mother had inherited some money. And she said to the children, she said, you can all have $1,000 to spend on what you would like. At the time, we were hand washing clothes, so a washing machine seemed to be the go. So a money order came through the post for $1,000 signed Christine Stead and I went to the post office and I gave the money order to the, to the, to the lady, behind the, lady behind the counter and she goes, that's funny. And I said, what's funny? And she goes, my name's Christine Stead. And I went, that is a coincidence. She said, oh, oh. She said you just look so much like my father, Rocky. I'll send my father out to speak to you. At the time I had a compost business running in conjunction with the gardening business and I was out at the compost plot one day and I see my father walking across the paddock and I thought, oh God, mum's died. He looks so grey and awful, something really, really bad has happened. And this vision of my father coming across the paddock with me worrying and then he got closer and I thought, that's not my father. It's Rocky Stead. Spitting image, absolute spitting image of my father and I. Bald head, ended up having the same sense of humour, ended up that his branch of the family were the people who'd been to Canada and come back to Burrell and Ivanhoe, which is just down the road from down, right, down the road from Griffith, which explained the story, which explained quite often I'd have people running up to me and go, oh, the, oh it's not you. <laughs> There's people who look like me. Anyway, we're talking to, talking to Rocky Stead and it turned out he was able to introduce my mother to the um, resident genealogist of their family and together they were able to put down the picture of what had happened to the Steads. Continuing on with genetics, the last generation is kind of interesting in the fact that my partner Judy on one side is related to Governor Lachlan Macquarie. On the other side, she's related to convict cells. And between us, we've produced a bald-headed boy who has fortunately had his mother's good looks and my sense of humour. 
My brother has married a lady who is Fijian on one side and Maori on the other side and looks Egyptian and has produced some beautiful, beautiful children, three beautiful children. My sister had the bad fortune to meet a mad Scotsman and one of her children has, the girl has gone on the Scotsman's side and she's short and very angry and the two boys are big boned like the Steads and as far as I know are going to lose their hair too. So that's pretty much the history of the Steads. Thank you. Wow. <laughs>